Hello, everyone. Ni hao. My name is Rafa Pedrazuela, and first of all, and on behalf of the entire EW Nutrition team, I would like to I would like to welcome you to this webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us, for adapting to this new way of working, and also I hope that you enjoy both the topic and the content of this webinar. Let me first introduce myself. I'm veterinarian by education and also have a master in business administration. My career has been developed entirely with pigs going through different companies. I was working um, five years in the field as a swan veterinarian. After that, I joined uh, Ford Dodge Animal Health. After that, I jumped into a German company as a swine technical director. And finally, and before going to EW Nutrition, I was working eight years in IPRA, which is called Hybali, in charge of the global swine vaccines. Currently, I'm working as a global technical manager for swine eight months ago, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you. So today, we are gonna cover the respiratory processes in China, putting the focus on your country. Uh, we wanted to cover this topic from different, uh, three different perspectives, as you can see reflected on the slide. The estimated time for this webinar will be around 35, 40 minutes. And after that, we will open the time for the questions and answers. So firstly, I will make an introduction about some thoughts I wanted to share with you. Secondly, I would like to share which are the main pathogens to bear in mind, and that way we could identify them. To jump immediately into prevention, where I would like to review with you the main preventive tools that we have available today. And finally, I wanted to show you that we need to help our pigs to relieve the respiratory processes you are having in your farms. And after that, I will make a conclusion. So let's go, let's go for it. It is almost impossible not to come to China virtually this time and not talk about African swine fever, right? But don't worry, because this is not the topic today. Despite, I, hear, I believe that it will have a strong influence on the market. So when we look into the Chinese market and we foresee which will be the future, we need to bear in mind different things. And those that are reflected in the slides gathers information about a report coming from Rabobank and also the National Bureau of Statistics in China. So in summary, African swine fever is still spreading in China, but at a slower pace. So it's going slowly. That's why, because the Chinese producers, meaning you, have improved their biosecurity levels. It is also a fact that backyard is decreasing and the restocking is mainly driven by the large players. And all, and all I think that it's also important to remark that the government is trying to stimulate the growth of production and also giving more space to build the farms. So at the end, in my opinion, the recovery of the Chinese swine production will be faster than expected, and this for sure will bring some consequences. Which are those consequences? So every day we can see in the news or in the in internet or in WeChat pictures like the ones that you can see in this area. So every single genetic company today is sending or creating their own farms in China to raise their own breeders. So with the African swine fever impact on China, probably you have heard that there are some estimations becoming, uh, coming from the experts that you will probably need more than 10 million gills in the near future, okay? And this for sure will bring some important consequences. Some of them are listed here. 
it will be, actually, it is also happening today, a massive entrance of new animals, new genetics, and of course, link it to that with a new microbiome or a new pathogen. Additionally, we will have in our farms, farms that today are very young for the huge replacement, we will have thousands of liters coming from gills, coming from primiparous sows, and this will have a reduced immune status, right? And of course, we cannot forget that the entrance of these new genetics will require new knowledge, new management, and new tools to get used to that uh, to that different uh, to that use uh, different uh, genetics. But I think that that's not all because you are going to live a new era. What you can see on the screen is a general overview about the current situation worldwide with regards different feed additives. And let me give you some example. For instance, in Europe, where I come from, think outside will be banned in two years. Or what happened in China this year. Now, in China, the use of the uh, antibiotics as a growth promoters is completely forbidden. And this, this scenario together with the, with the previous slide is something that you need to take into consideration when you design your medication against the main pathogens that your farms are going to live with. And which are these pathogens? Well, you can see here some of them. So you can see here the bacteria classified by the main system that are affecting respiratory, digestive or systemic here. And also you can see here the virus also classified by system. Of course, this is an example. Of course, this is something that can vary between farms and countries. But let's take a look to the uh, regions. So which are the main respiratory virus that are affecting, that are globally affecting to the, to the swine producers? So with the exception of Brazil, I would say that to me, the most important virus worldwide is R2. One is Pierce virus and the other one is swine influenza. Of course, we cannot forget PCV2, but I think that this is solved by the vaccination. If we look uh, closer, if we take a closer look into the Chinese market, we have quite a lot of origin virus that are affecting to your market, but I think that the most important one are listed here. You can see here African swine fever, uh, Pierce, swine influenza, and of course, Augeski disease or pseudorabies. Again, we cannot forget classical swine fever and PCV2, but these two ones, I would say, that are uh, solved by um, vaccination. Regarding the respiratory pathogens, when we are talking about bacteria, bacteria or mycoplasma, I think that the picture is quite similar along the different territories. So here we could, we could um, uh, highlight that here we are talking about three or four main pathogens. The first one to me is mycoplasma high pneumonia. The second one is actinobacillus pneumonia, and what I call the, the Swiss. In this case includes Lacerella parasuis and Strepsuis as a most important part. Good. If we analyze the pathogens by age, uh, here we have the birth of the animal, here we will have the winning, here we will have the entering into the fattening unit, and here we will have when we are sending on a regular basis the animals to the slaughterhouse, and here you can see the adults, we can see easily that the most important part, uh, pathogens from the, viral, from the virus point of view, like African swine fever and pseudorabies, can affect to all the ages, to all the animals. There is one important difference because when we are talking about peers, peers can affect to young animals at birth, to animals at weaning. Of course, we also can have problems with peers in the middle of the nursery, along the fattening period. And of course, you know very well that peers can affect sows, gills, and also both. But to me, another important key pathogen that we need to take a, look, a closer look is 
swine influenza that can also affect to the piglets in the middle of nursery, to the fattening unit, and also to all adult categories. When we are talking about bacteria, I think that we need to consider three, let's say four main pathogens. We need to consider mycoplasma and pneumonia. We need to consider Bordetella bronchiseptica, acting bacillus pneumoniae, and also the suis that are affecting in those ages and the development of the disease can be along the nursery and also along the fattening unit. Okay, so in summary, I'm trying to answer this question, which is the key pathogens to consider when we should uh, analyze which are the ones that are affecting more. I think that we need to put the focus in these three virus, and I think that we need to put the focus in these four bacteria. Of course, can vary again between countries and companies. And if you are able to work free of some of them, go ahead because you will, you will earn some more money. What is clear are the reasons. Some of them uh, are able to affect to many categories from piglets to uh, fattenings or even adults. Some of them could be part of many co-infections. And also, I think that the most important one is that most of them can have a very important economic impact, okay? And let me, let me give you some, some examples. For instance, if you, if you see here, when we are talking about peers, an infection with peers, there are some reports that can vary between 33 yuans per animal till 97. Okay, this is even harder when we are talking about co-infections, like the one that you can see here, Pierce plus mycoplasma, Pierce plus influenza, or influenza plus M high, right? Where the impact, the economic impact per peak is much, much higher. Okay, well, what should we do now? We have identified which, for me, are the most important pathogens. We know that these pathogens are costing a lot of money for uh, a lot of money in your in your operations and now what we need is to set up the strategies for preventing them okay and when we talk about controlling disease when we talk about preventing this issue the diseases we need to bear in mind many many different factors like like the one that you can see uh, here because Everything on the farms is completely related, okay? What we are gonna do in the next, in the following minutes is we will go through every of uh, every uh, button that you can see here, bearing in mind some of the pathogens that I just mentioned to all of you. Good. If we look at biosecurity, everyone uh, is or should be aware that there are two main points when we are talking about biosecurity. One is external biosecurity, and another one is external biosecurity. But at the end, the purpose and the outcome is more or less the same. We need to avoid the entrance of the, uh, of the diseases into the farms, and we also we need to avoid the development of the disease. And by doing that, what we will do in is avoiding the spread of the disease within the farms, the companies, the territories, or the countries, right? So the question is, in which diseases is, is really crucial biosecurity? Well, there is a simple answer because biosecurity is super important on every single disease. But there are some which today, the biosecurity or the levels of biosecurity is much more important. One example, of course, as you can imagine, is African swine fever, where biosecurity, because we don't have vaccines, is uh, crucial. I'm not gonna uh, talk about biosecurity because my colleague, Felipe Barbosa, did a presentation specifically covering this topic some weeks ago, together with my colleagues in EW Nutrition China. But, there are some other diseases where biosecurity is truly important, and PIRS is one of them. So to me, and here I'm putting uh, serious, to me, the PIRS virus is, and the PIRS infection 
is the cornerstone in tribe farms. It's completely different when you have when you are working with peers or when you are working without peers for obvious reasons. Obviously, it is impossible to me to cover uh, the control of peers virus in one slide, but I would like to mention to you which are the main pillars of controlling disease. So basically, when we are talking about peers, we have three options. One is to be free. Now that you are restocking your farms, please take advantage to do, to do that. The other one is eradicate, which is also possible, but is possible and it should be worldwide in case you are isolated in some territories or the most important one, or let's say the most common one, which is to live with the disease and trying to minimize the impact on your production, right? So as in every disease, what we need is to minimize the viral circulation around the farm. And to do that, we need to achieve, uh, to achieve that, we need to maximize the immune status, or let's say in another way, to homogenize the animal's uh, immune uh, system, right? In the case of, uh, in the particular case of peas, uh, what we need is to minimize the transplacental infection in order to reduce the viremic piglets in the lactation, and consequently, we will decrease the horizontal transmission through the pig, through the pig flows. Okay, and I think that this our this uh, will is is the key. To achieve that, there are many interventions to do because we are not talking about a simple disease, and all of them are quite important. But I think that we should start by knowing what we have. Diagnostic in peers is is a key element because we need to know when how and where the disease is moving around, which is important, of course, the management of the gills, because these animals are really the stabilizing element in every single farm. Of course, we cannot forget the immunization. Obviously, the vaccine is a tool, maybe is not 100% effective, but I think that it's a tool that can, can help if you are working on a peer's positive uh, flow. Again, biosecurity is really crucial, both external and also internal, external to avoid reinfection and internal to avoid the movement, the horizontal movement between the, the facilities, right? And of course, one key element is to make close follow-up because peers is not giving you any opportunity to get uh, some relax. Okay, I know I'm fully aware that you are thinking now, okay, Rafa, you are telling me the theory. I know, and I know that uh, this theory is very, very difficult to execute, but this is what we would have to do. That's, that's, the, that's the reality, right? Continuing with the elements that belong to the prevention uh, tree, let's say, of course, we need to. Uh, pay attention to the diagnostic, right? When we are talking about diagnostic, we are talking about before the arrival of the animals and also we are talking about the after the arrival of the animals. Here, I have really few things to say, but are quite important. Look at the diagnostic in both elements. So you cannot forget to make diagnosis on a regular basis about what is happening with your animals in the farms. Okay, and also, I'm sorry to tell you, but not all the diagnostic labs are reliable. There are some fails. Not all the people is really well prepared in order to provide you uh, this service. Now you are filling China with a lot of genetics. Please take the chance to work free of the disease. Try to work on a free basis for all the diseases that your suppliers of genetics can provide you, okay? And once analyze your, once you are having the, the samples, you need to be very, very quick and you need to be working on the differential diagnostics. It's really, really important in order to set up 
the better strategies to control the disease. Right, let's go for the third one, which is vaccination. And here we need to take into consideration two different things, which is the vaccine and the program. Vaccination, of course, and vaccines is something that could help us to prevent the diseases. We might, we might not be able to avoid the arrival of the pathogens because this is uh, impossible, but we are able to avoid the, the, development or the development of the disease through the vaccination. To me, we are, living, we are living a very special moment. Many of your farms might be quite new. Maybe of your farms are full of young uh, gills delivering a bunch of animals that are not very mature from the immunological point of view, and we need to take care of these animals. So in the question is, okay, you are, talking, you are talking about the vaccination, in which diseases is quite important, the vaccination. When we are talking about African trend fever, I think that it will be really important, the vaccination, or it will be really important to have a commercial, safe and effective vaccine because there are some vaccine fakes circulating around your country. Please be careful with that. When we are talking about swine influenza, I think that probably in your country you don't have vaccines, but it's a key element to help to reduce the infection pressure of this important virus in any farm. Already mentioned, but uh, from my point of view, PERS vaccine is a tool that can help you to control what we are talking about, uh, PERS infection and PERS disease. In my experience, and you know that I'm coming from, from Spain, where we will able, we will, we was able to reduce or to eradicate African soil fever. When we are talking about cerebral rabies or Abjeski disease, vaccination, it's mandatory as we will see later. I don't know any other way to control mycoplasma honeymoney, of course, with some help of the environmental than through vaccination. In my opinion, two shots is better than one shot. And this is specifically, especially more important when we have uh, a big challenge. It is also an important tool when we are talking about Glacerella parasuris or Bortetella bronchiseptica. But when we are talking about um, strep suis, I think that there are no commercial vaccines, or at least to my knowledge, and the results that we are obtaining are in some cases partial results with autogenous vaccines. Okay? Good. Just small chapter on the prevention of silver rabies. I know that you are working towards the reduction of the infection pressure. You are working towards the eradication. Here you can see again which are the main steps to control the disease are the same. But let me give you some, some advices. You need to vaccinate all the animals. There are no secrets. I mean, Pierce is very difficult to control. Silver rabies is very easy to control, but you need to, fo you need to follow some specific rules. The first one is to, you need to vaccinate every single animal, gills, sows, piglets, and feathers. You need to vaccinate with vaccines and adjuvants that will be able to reduce the viral excretion. Okay, of course, you need to consider that maybe in some, in some cases, specifically when you, are, when you are having outbreaks, you need to consider all rules, the intramuscular, intranasal, and maybe the intradermal rule, rule is also an interesting rule for the, for, the, for the future. And the secret to control Aoyeski disease is that you have to do it all together. Aoyeski virus is a virus that can be spread through the air. So if you don't agree with your neighbors, if you are not setting an agreement between both of your, all the farmers that you have in your region, you cannot be able to reduce or to decrease the infection pressure on a local, on a regional level, and you will fail, okay? Good. In the case of swine influenza, um, 
It is quite similar to Obieski. There is an important uh, difference when we compare swine influenza with peers because in this case, uh, there is no transplacental infection. So it, it, it's control, it's much easier. And again, the core objectives are to minimize the viral circulation. Again, if you can do it through the vaccines, you need to homogenize the immune status, the immune status of the animals, controlling this element that can unbalance every single thing in your farms. And of course, moving ahead, moving, to, moving forwards. So all the things that are related to the movement between inside the farms, sorry, it's are really, really important together with all the biosecurity measures and hygiene measures, okay? All right. So we have covered biosecurity. We have covered on a very quickly way, of course, diagnostics. We have covered vaccination and what about management? Everybody knows, and I think that everyone agree that management today is the most important factor you need to consider in any farm. When we are talking about management, we are not talking about only management of the animals, but also management of the facilities, right? Uh, uh, you know that everything is connected and here you can see some of, some of the examples about all the things that you need to consider when we are talking about management. But it's impossible to cover all the slides all in this, in this webinar. Let me give you just some uh, advices for you regarding management. Please be aware of the interconnections. I mean, every single thing that you touch in one place will have an impact in another place. Every single thing that you, every single intervention that you make in one newborn piglet will have an impact on their life, right? In many cases, rules of management, theory, and instructions are absolutely clear in papers, but not in the execution because you need to review. Please review on a regular basis all the instructions that you have provided to your manpowers, to your veterinarians, to your people, to the farmers, because you mustn't take anything for granted because one thing is the theory and another one is the practice. Another one is the execution, right? And the last one is about the risk factors because in some cases we take for granted that the risk factors are not affecting to our, our production and maybe we are underestimating these risk factors. This is specifically important in respiratory processes and also in digestive processes. And let's go for the last part of this uh, chart and let's talk about preventive or let's say a strategic medication with antibiotics or with alternatives. First of all, I would like to say that antibiotics are an excellent tool to control diseases. This is from our side, absolutely clear. We are also in favor of the responsible use of antibiotics. And this is particularly important now because we need to contribute to the reduction on, uh, of the antimicrobial reduction, antimicrobial resistance, sorry. But not only that, because um, today, the meat, as a consequence of your impact in, in, with African swine fever in China, today the meat market is global. And to me, it will be really, really important to work on the reduction on the antibiotic, on the antibiotics, specifically on the white rival periods, because this will be an added value for the consumer in the future. Maybe it's not now in China, but I can assure you that it will be uh, in the near future. And additionally, if we are reducing the, anti the antibiotics or substances like thincoxide, we will be contributing to make the production, the swine production, much more sustainable. And again, this will play a role 
with the consumers. So consumers in the near future in China will eat more meat for those companies that are working on the reduction of the antibiotics and also taking care of the planet. This is my advice for you today. So for all these reasons that I just mentioned, I think that is needed or it's mandatory to look for alternatives. In EW Nutrition, we are quite confident that fat or milk molecules will be a real alternative to this massive use of antibiotics that some, sometimes some companies are using. The reasons for this, this statement are quite simple. There are interesting papers, as you will see later, demonstrated that many important pathogens, we have MICs, minimum inhibition concentration, and MBCs, minimum bactericidal concentration, with these photomolecules, right? But not, all, not, only, not only that, we also have, we also know that phytomolecules or essential oils could have an impact on two important bacterial uh, mechanisms like biofilm and chromosome sensors. We have combinations that, of these molecules that are not only having an antimicrobial effect, but also are having anti-inflammatory uh, effect, right? And finally, depending on the formulation that you are working with, you can use them through different bias, like the feed or like the water, with two different approaches, like a preventive or a supportive tool to recover or to help the animals to recover on a faster way. Well, respiratory processes lead to these animals that you can see here on the screen. Look at the breathing, right? Probably this animal is not only infected by a single pathogen, but a co-infection with virus and bacteria. We also know that this will have an important impact on the performance because the reduction of the average daily gain, the increase of the feed conversion ratio, the mortality, and so on. And it's absolutely clear that this is gonna be, this is gonna have an important economic impact in your population. So to me, this animal is probably very difficult to say, but in general, I think that when we are talking about respiratory processes, we need, of course, to prevent the development of all of them with all the tools that I just mentioned in a very brief way. But I think I'm convinced that we also have to relieve the symptoms that respiratory pathogens can cause to the animals to minimize the, this economic impact and also to avoid further complications or further development of symptoms, right? And which are the symptoms? Very easy. You can have cough, you can have sneezing, or even in some cases you can have some bleeding. And all of them can lead to different lung lesions that you can see with the different, with, with the different diseases, right? If we review which are the main strategies for controlling uh, pathogens, here you can see the virus and here you can see the bacteria. Of course, and we mark, we select which is the importance of this one. I think that we could have a clear picture about which, more, which one is much more important than others. And let me put you one example. For instance, when we think about, when we first think about PCV2, so the first thought, although everything is important because biosecurity is important, vaccination is important, hygiene is important, and environment is important, the first thought that come to our mind, of course, is vaccination. On the opposite way, when we are thinking about strep suis, as there are no vaccines, the first thing that come to our mind could be the strategic medication, together with all the tools that you can see here, right? So the question is, why are not thinking on strategic medication for, with phytomolecules for all? the respiratory processes, both virus and bacteria. And then 
there is a linked question to this one. And this question is, which would be the objective, the objective of, this, of this treatment? And I'm gonna summarize for you some of the objectives. The first one that you can see here is, of course, to reduce the growth of secondary bacteria. So many, many respiratory processes, I would say most of them are co-infectious. And we understand that in many cases, the use of these type of molecules, the use of these photomolecules could reduce the growth of these secondary bacteria, right? There are, believe me, thousands of papers talking about the future of the phytomolecules as a tool to replace the use of the antibiotics, right? And how these products are working. So essentially, what these products are doing is degradating the bacterial cell walls. So these substances are lipophilic and they are interacting with the bacterial walls. And in this interaction, what is happening is that there is an exchange of the ions and the protons on the transit of this process. And this process is unbalancing the cells and this is going to destroy the, uh, the, cell, the, the cell wall, right? This is going to destroy the membrane proteins. This is going to, uh, fo this is going to be followed by a leakage, a leakage of the cell contents, and this is going to be a stop in the bacterial growth. So you can see here which are the different steps. So es essentially, we could summarize that uh, phytomolecules are lipophilic and destroy the bacterial cell walls, right? Another important objective when we are talking about preventing or relieving the symptoms of the respiratory processes for our animals is uh, exactly this one, relieve the respiratory symptoms. Probably you know that on the lungs, we have two kinds of clearance systems. One is the mucociliar clearance for bigger particles, and another one is the alveolar clearance for smaller particles. When the system fails because there is an increase of mucus production, uh, this would be a really important problem for two main reasons. Of course, as you can imagine, when you have when you are having mucus on the on the lungs, this is gonna alter the regular respiratory tract functioning, right? And secondly, an excess of mucus is the perfect substrate for secondary bacterial infections. So somehow we need to try to eliminate the mucus excess, right? So taking into consideration their activity. I strongly suggest you to bear in mind these kind of products that could help our animals to overcome those that are the collateral effects of these respiratory processes. In both cases, in viral infections and also in bacterial infections. So some of the molecules that you can find in these products, at least in, in the ones that we are having, we are working in China, in EW Nutrition, could help on many different ways. For instance, they are also able to reduce the cough and the inflammation with molecules like cineol, for instance. Another important uh, fact is that molecules like eucalyptus or peppermint somehow with the components that are included in the formulation like menthol or cineol have a strong spectrum activity through the elimination of that particular mucus accumulation, right? Additionally, we could regenerate the cilia on the trachea, and this will help uh, the, the animals as a barrier to avoid the entrance of the particle and pathogens, okay? And in some cases, we have seen in some experience in some markets that the use of these molecules, this, the use of these products in the water can increase the appetite and the water intake, and this is really relevant for overcome the respiratory uh, processes. 
Another important extra objective that uh, when we are talking about uh, pigs and we are talking about uh, respiratory processes is the reduction or of the biofilm and the reduction of the quorum sensing. You know that quorum sensing today is how the bacteria are communicating among them, right? So quorum sensing can regulate a number of activities like the virulence factors, like the sporulation, the sporulation like the, the biofilm formation, or even can be can have an impact on the resistance to different antibiotics. Well, some of the components that we are including in our in our products, of course, has a clear interaction with biofilm and quorum sensing by, for instance, simply degradating the molecules that are interfering in the signal between the different cells. Or for instance, when we are talking about eugenol or cyanamaldehyde, some of these uh, molecules that we're using in our products can inhibit the formation of the biofilm in many, in many cases, right? Good. We also may have an extra, but I would say really important objectives from my point of view. In most of the markets, the use of antibiotics at the very end of the fattening period is forbidden. These represent the week number one of the piglets and these represent the week number 24. So this is the, this is the birth and this is when we are sending the animals to the, to the slaughterhouse, right? So in many cases, as I was saying, the use of uh, antibiotics at the very end of the fattening uh, period is completely forbidden to respect the white rival period. To me, one of the key elements that we could use, that we could take advantage of the uh, fatal molecules, at least in our case, we don't have white rival period, is to take advantage of this moment and to use this product in this particular period, okay? Another important one is to avoid mm, further complications in some respiratory processes that are happening in, in our farms. In many cases, we only have processes, a simple circulation with Augeski disease or Pierce disease that is not even complicated. That is the, the specific moment and the specific approach that we could use with these photo molecules, right? So here you can see, these are the virus and here you can see the bacteria, right? And the X or let's say the crosses represents when are more probably to appear the respiratory processes or the respiratory symptoms of these diseases by week. Of course, this can vary but this is only a representative tool for you to take into consideration that the use of these fatal molecules as a tool to relieve or to support the complications of those respiratory processes could be around the week six, week seven, and week eight, because most of the bacteria and, are, and virus are appearing here or immediately after the entering into the fattening period, or as I was saying, at the very end of the fattening period, right? Good. So, which are our final recommendations for the use of the these uh, our fatal molecules in the soil farms? I would say that, as a general rule, essential oils or fatal molecules uh, do not replace conventional pharmacological uh, treatments like antibiotics. We need to consider that these molecules could be very, very useful on some particular moments as a complement or uh, to a conventional therapy, reducing the losses of productivity, promoting pig's health, and also increasing the comfort and maybe the feed and the water intake. Of course, not all the products are able to do that. Uh, not all the products are in working on the same way. You need to take into consideration things like the concentration, the standardization, or 
depending on the way that you are going to supply, you are going to deliver these, these products, you need to maybe implement specific technologies that can help to avoid the loss of activity. This could be, for instance, the encapsulation for the molecules that you can use for the feed or the emulsification for the molecules that you are going to use for the water or in some cases how to apply these products through the nebulization, right? So to me, essential oils should be given from the very first moment that we suspect animals are having or are starting to see or are starting to suffer some respiratory processes. And this is what is summarized here. So preventive approach is what we consider better and the early intervention is key. This is exactly what we are doing with two of the products that we are having in China today. One is Ventar L and another one is Ventar uh, uh, RES, right? Well, this is my final slide. And I wanted to conclude by just reminding which are the topics that we very briefly, I know, I'm sorry for that, we discussed here today. So to me, the future of Chinese pig production, I think it's gonna be brilliant. Of course, I know that you are suffering, but I think that you are improving. I also think that we need to learn, you need to learn uh, different things about the different genetics that you are having. There are new genetics, new animals and new pathogens entering in your country and probably you need to, be, you need to uh, learn uh, how to treat them and how to manage these animals. And I think that this could be crucial. Additionally, I think that China, as any other market, uh, will be in the same site. You're, so you will have less antibiotics to control the pathogens and this is going to be uh, as, as it is. Uh, so you will need to make a big effort to, to control, right? We need to be very specific. We need to be very specific on the identification uh, of those animal, of those pathogens that can are key for the respiratory pathogens. Maybe you disagree partially with my statements, but bear in mind African sun fever, of course, uh, bear in mind peers, of course, and when we are talking about bacteria, bear in mind mycoplasma in the morning and probably the suis are the most important one. I think that everybody knows that prevention is key. Everybody knows that uh, each pathogen has their own strategies and the secret is the combination of both of them, right? And also, and this is something that I want to highlight, once you have identified the pathogens, once you have applied the prevention, and of course, respiratory processes are happening in your farms, you need to take care of the animals. You need to relieve the respiratory symptoms through the photomolecules that may help to reduce or further development of different diseases or reduce the economic impact that these pathogens are causing to your farms. And with this, I think that I'm done. I wanted to say thank you very much for your attention and thank you to my team in EW Nutrition China. Thanks Lee, thanks Caroline, thanks uh, Craig. It's a pleasure to help you, it's a pleasure to support you. And I think that I'm ready to take some of the questions that you may have. Thank you very much and cheers.